Blockchain, AI and Ethics, Risks and Challenges. This is another, I think, very, uh, very important issue. And um, especially by, when, with ChatGPT, it suddenly became very vivid uh, to all of us and everybody talking about ethics. And uh, because everybody is seeing all these dangers that might be involved with it, that may be involved with it. Um, and yes, so, so the question is really how to deal with it. And Wojcic, um, you are a developer. And of course, there's always a lot of opportunity in doing things, a lot of ideas. Uh, uh, do you have the ethic um, already involved when you're doing it? Because very often people are just developing things and then suddenly they realize that uh, you can do a lot of harm with it. So how? Uh, what is your approach? Sure. Well, I, I think, first of all, one advantage of being the oldest one up here uh, is that technology always brings two sides to it. And so, for example, the hammer, the hammer can build a house, but it also can knock it down. And so we have to understand that whether it was in the early 90s all the way through, people had fear of new technology. So the secret to building, whether it's on the blockchain or artificial intelligence, is to build something that has a tendency to be used as a servant, not as a master. So building technology with the capabilities of being of service and allowing it to, uh, obviously, with in the right hands, to develop more good things. But I think the reality is you never can anticipate all the negativity where people use it as a master, use it to break down the house instead of to build the house. And I think the way you market it, the way you inform the public of it, will do and have a lot to do with how it's used. Yeah, and I think we all agree that education will be key for the future, Taylor. Uh, the, this is your specific approach. You bring education or you promote education. Um, so uh, what can we do? Because I think it's a very long, uh, long process to get people ready. It's something that's very close to me, this issue. Uh, how, can we, how can we do it? So I think it's a, a huge problem with a lot of different vectors. Like on one side, there's general awareness. So just teaching people about AI, how it works, when you can, like when you're getting an answer from AI versus a human, so you actually understand when you're interacting with AI, just to have that baseline knowledge. But then flipping to the other side is using AI for education to teach. And there's so many questions in there, like what's the training data? You know, we can't agree as society, especially as an American, you look at the US, everyone is so divided, we can't even agree what's fact or fiction. So the AI now is becoming this sort of de facto uh, order of truth. And so I think there's a lot of questions around the bias of the training data, around the way that these tools are actually deployed for education, because, yeah, that would make a huge difference if there were small biases. Uh, well, um, David, um, how do you deal with uh, what's your approach on ethics and how to include that into your enterprises? Uh, so regarding the AI and ethics, uh, we need to know that ethics in AI is like quality and software development. This is not something that you can add uh, to the final product. It is something that you need to build from ground up. You need to think about on every stage of the product development, on every stage of the data gathering, data processing. Because uh, it is so complex and it, it can have such an impact on the, on the uh, answers itself that we get that uh, you can't, uh, can't fine-tune it in, in the last stage of the product. So we are trying to, um, to think about all these hard questions uh, at the, the very early stages of the, of the product development. And this, I think, can bring us uh, many benefits and decrease the number of risk that can arise after a uh, product is already delivered. Okay, last one in this row, uh, Xenia. Uh, you have a, well, 
you do a lot of things, but uh, you have a background in the finance industry, and we all know when it comes to ethics um, and money, that do doesn't go too well together. We have seen that in all these uh, crypto exchange scandals re recently. Um, so, uh, how, what is your approach on it, and yeah, how can this uh, issue be tackled? Okay, so um, AI definitely, um, it's not a new thing, it's an existing thing, but what we've seen, and with ChatGPT, as you mentioned, it, uh, it went to the public more broadly, and now we see a lot of solutions, uh, especially also in finance. Um, it releases a lot of our hands um, in compliance, AML, because it helps you analyze data, uh, you know, uh, do a lot of things with analyzing, but the human factor is the most important. And this is my view. When you, it releases our hands, the technology, but on the other hand, the decision making is on the human. So if you uh, take the technology and you use the human factor to uh, make decisions or to decide how to guide the, the, the AI, and this is where my approach would be, put some ethical standards, because you mentioned the, the scandal. If there, if there are some ethical frameworks, uh, when you are even building the, the technology, just general frameworks, I'm not talking about uh, stiffing uh, innovation and all of that, then we'll have a, a very balanced approach uh, on, on, develop, on developing. Well, I liked your the little question where you were posing earlier when you said uh, when you were bringing the uh, humanity and the age of AI together, and that how can we uh, how can we ensure it that we uh, that humanity is not uh, losing in this game? And I think it would be very disastrous if it, if it would. So, what's your what's your approach on that? And I also would like to pass this question uh, to everybody. Yeah, as I mentioned before, it's like um, it's uh, the AI is developed by humans, uh, but at the end of the day, the, and it helps the human uh, humans to be more um, productive and uh, take uh, decisions better. But at the end of the day, the decision maker has to be the human factor, and where we need even with education, as you mentioned before. Uh, the teachers uh, it gives them certain models, but they have to teach the children how to use AI in a critical thinking and uh, teach the model and use the model in a constructive way. And, that, and also the, uh, the barriers you have to put, ethical barriers, so you don't misuse it and you respect society and you respect data privacy. And this is where, again, I had, it was in the previous panel about Regulating it, it's about putting general frameworks in regulation. And the regulators across different nations agree on a general framework. Yeah, so just, yeah. Uh, I think that we need to think about AI as a technology like any other. Maybe it will be in the future the more advanced technology that we ever came up to, but it still uh, depends how we will use it. and. Uh, I think that if we will mm, use some guidelines in most of the of the product, we will still come to some unpredictable outcomes. But at the same time, uh, we need to think how can we counteract such uh, such outcomes. And when if we will have this uh, in mind every time building a solution, uh, we will be able to counteract most of the issues that we will find during the process. I mean, I think <clears throat> AI is very painted in this doomsday light a lot of the time, like robots are going to take over and destroy humanity. And while that is a non-zero chance, it's like, you know, I think the, the big thing is like AI actually can create post-scarcity for humanity. Like we can move into a phase where nobody is starving. Nobody doesn't have access to clean water and internet. Everyone has the resources they need to at least get up that first few rungs of Maslow's pyramid. And then we move into bigger questions around mental health and fulfillment and like these questions around like you see suicide rates rising. Like that is so incredibly sad and painful. But at the same time, you see starvation, you see like these sort of deep levels of poverty getting better. So I think 
there is this whole other side where AI can be a partner to humanity to create post-scarcity, but we have to, again, in the ethics and the risks, like be thinking about mental health and helping people sort of transition into this new state. I think Taylor, you're right on track with the technology, teaching people values. You know, AI is best from zero to one. Human beings are great from one to a hundred. And so two of the things that I think will make a distinctive difference in the world is not only understanding AI, but truly one, working on your people skills. So the more we teach gratitude and empathy, accountability, inspiring thoughts and values to utilize AI, because the same way we have an exponential fear of what AI can do in a negative way, if we're teaching good values and using AI to teach good values, like you said, it creates a more abundant world. When people have less fear, they use things as if they are not afraid in a positive way. So the hammer is used to build a, a house, not knock it down. And getting the basic needs of air and water and food, all of these things that we can provide with AI, people forget how important it is to teach these values. And the second one, which I think, uh, especially parents out there beyond teaching values and teaching kids to use AI to increase abundance, <clears throat> is reading. I think one of the greatest differentiators that's gonna occur and always has is as we have more fake things through AI, that if we teach our children to read, they're gonna be able to distinguish whether something's real or not. And I see it already with emails that go out. You get these emails and kids aren't reading and therefore there's fraud perpetrated, human trafficking perpetrated. If we just would teach our children personal skills like gratitude, empathy, accountability, inspiring thoughts and values, and how to read, you're gonna see that they'll be utilizing AI to help the world, feed the world, clean air the world, clean water, all the things that are gonna create less fear. A world full of less fear, as you know, is a peaceful world that works at ease and in abundance. Well, but uh, we all see that uh, reading is declining because everybody is moving towards short form video and, uh, and social media communication. So how can we tackle, uh, how can we tackle that? Yeah, that's great. You must be watching my videos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the middle aged mutant turtle of Instagram. Um, you, <laughs> you have to tackle it through a new education system. We have to rethink education and be utilizing short form video to teach people reading and to stress the importance of personal values and things like that. And unfortunately, there's this huge energy gap in the world. Uh, and if you do watch my videos, I try to teach people the difference between I am and this is what I want people to think I am. Mm -hmm. And if we can create that I am in our young people and let them feel comfortable, not worried about what's missing, what they don't have, mm -hmm. what people think, you'll find that they'll be inspired through short form videos to actually move back to reading books or just reading online or wherever they read. Well, Taylor, um, you will represent the younger generation, though you are closer to today's newcomer. Um, and you're dealing specifically with education. So um, is there really a problem or um, what are the ways to tackle the situation or is it really so, is educating becoming more uh, difficult? So I guess the way that I look at it, as someone who was in third grade when we started getting computers in the school and started to not go to the library and go to the computer lab instead. So I was right on that fringe of, you know, like going from the, the physical to the digital world. And one thing that, you know, really sticks with me is the fact that if you think about like the way that the brain has developed in humans to date, you have sort of these like... Uh, these patterns from like the limbic system and parts of the brain that are automatic. It's just running your organs, it, your breathing, it's things that you either can't control at all or can like consciously say, okay, I'm going to blink or I'm going to breathe consciously. But then on top of that, you have the neocortex and the part of the brain that can set goals and do complex tasks. And that like that, that part of the brain is at service to the limbic system, which is I'm hungry, I'm tired. So then you plan, how am I going to get food? How am I going to go to sleep? So you have this smart part of your brain planning for the, for the dumb brain. 
So I always think about AI as we move into, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, like what's happening with Neuralink, what's happening with sort of shortening the communication distance between the thought and compute is that we will now have a third level that is at service to the second level, which is at service to the first level. But ultimately, we can be in control of that process. So I think that's one sort of overarching theory of like how humans will think in 50 years, basically. And as part of that, it's not important for us to memorize facts. It's not important for us to try to cram knowledge. It's important to develop good values, to know how to be a good person, to engage with other people, to find the good in things, be optimistic. And so, and then of course, like critical thinking and uh, sort of overarching skills, how to process that data. But I do think we're shifting from this era where you had to go to the library, cram the information from the book into your brain because you wouldn't have access to it when you're operating on a patient or something to now abundance of data and the ability to sort of shift the way that we interact with it. And I think social media is playing a huge role in that with the content and the way that like short form content is being delivered and reading is, yeah, I mean, yeah, good luck getting a kid to sit down and read a novel now, you know, so. But you're addressing a very interesting issue here because over the, uh, the centuries, uh, from the, our beginning, we were really uh, trained on uh, going for short-term solutions because they always gave us uh, the head start over our competitor. And that's very deep inside, uh, engraved inside us. But uh, today we are in a period where we really need uh, to, th to uh, get into a much longer term uh, way of thinking and we're just not used to it. So, um, yeah. So how do we get there to accomplish that, what you, what you just mentioned? Have you an idea, David? Or I think that uh, what we are talking, so that we are trying to short the uh, path from the question to the answer, it will continue. I don't think that we can change in this manner because the times are that everything the wa we want is closer and closer. These are the things that, uh, let, let's just think about economy. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, think about better phones, better cars, better everything. So the time to getting the answer also should be closer. So I think that we will use AI for finding answers more quickly. And I don't think that in many cases we will question the answer which we get. And this is a problem that in many cases we we can see right now this uh, in the, I could say, chat GPT era. Right now, many people are treating answers from chat GPT as an oracle, as something that can give you a right answer to everything. And this is not exactly the case. Uh, and we need to learn that AI is a really great tool, but I don't think that many of us will question the outcome, will question the answer that we get. And when we will, right now, I could say that we are at the start of the huge AI era, when the true AI will be everywhere around us. And I think that the more we dwell into this era, the less we will question the outcomes. And this is the thing that can have <laughs> sometimes, I think, unpredictable results. Well, Senia, okay, I see you already getting ready to say something, but I want to add something because the balance of um, also getting invo innovations involved in, in this entire system and to progress innovation is important too, but uh, so includes that in your... Yeah, what I, what I also the other people mentioned in my belief is that we are very lucky that we have the technology It's and... Uh, and uh, it's important, however, as you mentioned before, to teach or teach uh, children or ourselves to adapt to this new technology and have critical thinking. That's one of the most important things because it can give you solutions. We should not be afraid that AI will take our jobs. We have to use AI in order to be more efficient and do better in our jobs. Um, also, all people have to collaborate, all stakeholders from the regulators, from the people that are, the, from the developers, from all this, all the parties, all these people have to collaborate in order to uh, define the, the framework. Because there, there, I'm, I'm of the people that I believe there needs to be a framework 
for the good of the society. So there has to be ethical uh, framework in how to use the AI to respect data privacy, to respect uh, the data. Other than that, let technology evolve and it's gonna do miracles, it's gonna give many solutions to the future and it indeed is going with a fast pace. That's why a lot of people have come and collaborate, not only on a national level, because on the previous panel you also, you also mentioned cross-border uh, cross and all of that, because it's good to have a, um, a framework of where AI is developed on a global scale, at least some standards on a global scale, because we are we're living in an interconnected world. So a global standard has to be in place, but standards, and most of all, on ethical values and respecting the society. That's my uh, conclusion. Well, I fully agree, and that's something I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm deeply involved with, but also I'm very skeptic because collab uh, collaborate uh, globally and getting this uh, standard set, I, I think it's very difficult. We're since we're right now in a period where everything seems to be... Framework. Yeah. I understand you cannot have the details. You have to uh, respect also the, even the cultural differences between different countries because some right. countries they say this is private, the others not. But the general concept I'm saying, some the general framework, and it could be uh, mm -hmm. achievable. Yeah, I, I think there's sort of there's push and pull mechanisms. There are governments that can put regulatory frameworks in place that can force and like push these requirements onto people against their will. You could say. But then there are... But also the, also the governments are pushing against each other too. Right. Well, so, so there's, there's a lot of these forces. But if we can actually align incentives so that commercially it's more valuable as a company to invest in a deep fake recognizer rather than a deep fake generator, as one example, so that the incentives are actually aligned to build tools that will solve this. Okay. Can I have one, oh. one thing just real quick? I think it's really important when we're talking about this idea of culture. There's a different culture today that we don't recognize a lot of time. It, it's a social silo. So beyond borders, people are being fed information. So they're being fed their values, their risks, their challenges. And we have to identify these large social silos that exist. And we can change and actually break through the borders if we start marketing and educating through the social silos and not just necessarily rely on governments and borders in order to effectuate a similar culture. Excellent point, but also difficult to accomplish, but I completely agree. All, all of this is. Definitely, very complex, everything. So my last question, a very short, uh, what is uh, the most da dangerous aspect of AI for you? Just fear, I, I think, uh, you, go ahead. Yes, I would say, if you take, if you take it for granted, if you think it's there and gives you an answer and you take it for granted, you have to use critical thinking. Human factor. <laughs> That's my... Uh, I think that, uh, of course, uh, some kind of uh, conflict where, uh, you know, AI uh, will uh, result in killing a lot of people. Uh, it can, you know, we have predicted so many things in sci-fi movies. This is also thing that is very possible to happen. I'm not saying that uh, AI will revolt, but it can be, you know, just the uh, mi misuse of something. So, you know, this is thing I think we still should uh, should fear the most. I mean, the Matrix, right? <laughs> Everything was, everything's a movie. That's what's so good. They're re-engineering a dinosaur now. I'm like, didn't you see Jurassic Park? This is a bad idea, happened. right? I, I think it's generating fear and it's always, if you study history, human nature never changes. It's either ease or dis-ease. And if AI is perpetuating more dis-ease, we're going to have a lot more problems. And so we want to make sure that the majority of AI is used to create ease, not dis-ease. We still have time for a question. Wait. Uh, maybe if anyone has any questions, we may use another minute. Yes. Come in. 
So uh, I have a background in blockchain and for me, it's very interesting actually to see how blockchain can help AI or AI can help blockchain, vice versa. But I think, have you there a specific opinion on it or yeah, some things where you think uh, both technologies can complement each other? Uh, so maybe I can start as uh, I am. I have huge uh, blockchain uh, background. Uh, blockchain and that I will uh, in the future, uh, maybe in very near time, will uh, connect in many other ways. Because on blockchain, every action of the user you can see, so you can process the data. In not other any uh, chain of uh, market, you can see everything. And because of that, there are a lot of things that you can use, for example, to, to predict some, some movement, to create some countermeasure, to uh, fraud detect. Uh, so I think that from many of these cases, the, the AI and blockchain will align uh, sooner than later.